Uh, we're delighted to be convening this uh, panel on does Africa have a democratic future or more uh, literally a democratic future for Africa, question mark. And uh, it's a particularly exciting time to be discussing this. We're acutely aware of the anti headwinds, the challenges of democratization and democratic development around the world. And these cross currents are no less salient and no less uh, relevant in uh, the, uh, the continent of Africa and, and particularly sub-Saharan Africa where our panelists uh, regularly focus. So what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to show a few slides that summar summarize and demonstrate some trends across the continent. And then we're gonna have commentary uh, from our panelists. And I'm really delighted that we were able to get our A-list for this event and uh, to have it at a, an important time during the term. To my uh, direct right, and I'm introducing people in alphabetical order, is Professor Nick Cheeseman, who's Professor of Democracy at the University of Birmingham and was formerly Director of the African Studies Center at Oxford University. Uh, if I read all of his publications and various professional achievements, we would just run out the clock here and uh, there would be little else to say. Suffice to say that he's worked in uh, nearly a dozen African countries on a range of issues from the quality of democratic institutions to the character of elections. And he is author or co-author uh, or editor of at least 10 books, including Democracy in Africa, Institutions and Democracy in Africa, the tantalizingly titled How to Rig an Election, and the uh, important recent statement, The Moral Economy of Elections in Africa. And so he's been visiting at SICE Europe for the last 10 days, and we're very delighted to have him join this panel. We hope to be joined later in the panel by Professor uh, Emmanuel Jima Boadi, uh, although we're having some issues with scheduling and we'll have to put a, a, a potential asterisk there, but I think he'll be able to weigh in later on the panel. He is a co-founder of the Afrobarometer Survey Research Network and served as CEO uh, from 2008 to 2021 of that uh, really foundational set of academics and practitioners who have tracked attitudes toward democracy and uh, the economy across 35 African countries over the last two decades and have generated just a wealth of data about uh, African attitudes and behaviors. He's also a founding leader of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development. He's won a Lifetime Achievement Award or a Lifetime Africanist Award from the US African Studies Association. And he is a member of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences and the editorial board of the Journal of Democracy and the Advisory Council of the Ibrahim Index. Uh, I'm Peter Lewis. I am uh, here at Tice Europe for the fall term. Uh, pardon me for the spring term. I, I wish it was the fall term too, but uh, uh, life moves on through the spring term. I've been director of African studies in Tice, Washington for about 16 years. I'm currently faculty lead for uh, both Africa and Middle East. And I've worked extensively on democracy and development in particularly in West Africa. Uh, Professor Chiedo Nwankwar is our current Vice Dean for Education and Academic Affairs at SICE Washington, as well as a lecturer and director of SICE Women Lead. Her primary areas of specialization are comparative politics with a focus on African politics, and she works extensively on and in women and gender studies. Uh, she has focused quite a bit on women's political participation with an emphasis on ministerial politics in Africa, women's health and health policy, feminist international relations, and the political economy of gender. Uh, 
And we're delighted that she's joining us from Washington for this panel. And finally, uh, the recent colleague to join our faculty, uh, Professor Obiora Okafor, who is the Edward Burling Chair in International Law and Institutions at SAIS in Washington, and also happily visiting uh, this week. He is the UN Independent Expert on Human Rights and International Solidarity and a former chairperson of the UN Human Rights Council Advisory Committee. He previously taught at the Osgood Hall Law School of York University in Toronto, and he is the author of multiple books uh, and edited uh, contributions and, and journal articles in the area of uh, global legal studies, regional legal issues, and uh, legal development in Africa, and uh, rule of law issues, uh, particularly in Nigeria. So national, regional, global. Um, I think every level of analysis that exists. Um, so uh, what I wanna do is uh, frame this, pre this uh, panel a little bit for a couple of minutes and then move directly to uh, a few slides. Uh, I'm glad to be joined by this stellar group of colleagues who can address issues of institutions, of attitudes, of gender, of rule of law, uh, as well as the uh, prolific knowledge of a variety of African experiences. We're in an era, as we know, of democratic pessimism. Globally, democratic governance is challenged in many regions by ambitious dictatorships, autocratic uh, collaboration and solidarity between uh, autocrats, the rise of populism and other uh, headwinds that make democratic development quite challenging. Within Africa, there's been a flurry of recent coups or coup attempts in Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Sudan, Mali, Guinea, and Chad. These raise questions about the fragility of democracy and the persistence of military influence across the region. No question, Africa's democratic governments face substantial headwinds. Many key institutions such as legislatures and judiciaries are fragile. Politicians are often self-serving. Economic performance has been volatile and polarized societies have sometimes fostered gridlock and other times they have fostered conflict. The tarnished reputation of major democracies around the world uh, and some in Africa has reduced the appeal of electoral rule and increased the opportunity for authorities to sow influence and for, pardon me, autocrats to sow influence. But notwithstanding these uh, sobering circumstances that we all know about, I will argue that democracy has proven resilient as an idea and as a form of government government in the region. And it's useful to raise uh, some points uh, along those lines. The global trend toward democratization of the 1990s has permanently altered Africa's political landscape. Africa reflected a tectonic shift after 1991 from a continent largely populated by autocracies to a region with many electoral governments, including several vibrant democracies. And this, the recent coups should be seen in perspective. There are many fewer military adventures today than in previous decades. As you'll see momentarily, from 1960 to 1990, the first three decades, after the moment of independence or the era of independence in Africa, there were 66 coups. In the next 20 years, there were, uh, next 30 years, pardon me, there were 38 or about half the number. And since 2000, there have been 22. So the number of coups, and we can see a periodization momentarily, shows us that, that um, notwithstanding the recent flurry of military interventions, uh, the, the numbers have trended downward. The general direction of democratic development has not shifted. Political diversity is evident in Southern Africa, in Eastern Africa, and in West Africa, 
less so in Central Africa, but nonetheless, many governments have politic considerable political space, including opportunities for independent civil society to organize uh, autonomous media, some space for an independent rule of law, uh, pluralism in uh, local governments and legislative domains, and a variety of other sources of uh, diversity and pluralism within uh, the political domain. That said, there is unquestionably a democratic recession in many parts of the continent. Democratic performance has been disappointing and a number of countries have become less democratic or even shifted to autocracy. In 2000, nearly three dozen countries were full or partial democracies. And today the number is around 30. So there's been a slight uh, decline and, and a recession. And we can talk about that in context. But let me uh, turn to some slides and make a couple of quick points about uh, what the data tells us. And then I will turn to Professor uh, Cheeseman for some remarks and Professor uh, Noankor will, uh, will follow. So we've seen a wave of coups in uh, Africa in the current, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, there we go. In the current era, we've seen a, a wave of coups and interventions in uh, February in Guinea-Bissau, in last September in Guinea, in Mali, uh, in Burkina Faso, all in West Africa within the last several months. And there has been uh, an intervention in Sudan, which is still highly contested. And this has led many people to question whether or not uh, there is in fact a new wave of autocracy, autocracy uh, and democratic failure in the region. Uh, let me, can, is there a possibility of going to the next slide? That's perfect. But as we can see from the data, excellent. Thank you so much. As we can see from the data, um, the number of coups has been declining. The, the period, the high period of, of uh, coups and interventions was really the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s. There were a number of failed coups in the 90s, but the number of successes declined. And by the new century, uh, those numbers have really collapsed. And so, whereas uh, between 1960 and 1969, there were 26 coups in the first nine years of the 2000s, there were eight coups. And so the number of military interventions, the success of military interventions has clearly been trending downward, speaking to a level of resilience and democratic survival uh, across much of the continent. These figures uh, from uh, VDEM, uh, I think, yes, that's correct. Uh, these figures show uh, a resilient plateau of democratization that was consistent with the so-called democratic wave of the early 1990s, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and uh, democratization across most regions of the world, largely passing by uh, the Middle East and North Africa. But Africa is uh, visible here in green. Um, no, excuse me, it's visible here in orange. And we can see that uh, the number of democracies sharply increased, the average level of democratization uh, Went, went up in 1990 and has stayed relatively consistent, in, indeed trending upward in, in some periods as well. And so this slide shows that uh, there was a, a shift globally, which included Africa around 1990, and that that has not been reversed. That has been largely sustained in terms of uh, the assessments and evaluations and ratings, if you will, of governance in the region. In 2015, we see uh, a variety of different systems around the continent. 
using Freedom House categories of free, partly free, and not free, there is indeed a large geographic band of autocracy that traverses uh, parts of Southern Africa, Angola, and goes diagonally across the continent to the Horn of Africa and through Central Africa. This is discouraging, but at the same time, much of Southern Africa, parts of West Africa are well-functioning democracies or deemed free by uh, the Freedom House language. And other countries across those regions of East Africa, Southern Africa, the subregions, and West Africa are considered to be uh, partly free or electoral democracies with relatively open civic space, relatively equal or open access to information for citizens, and some elements of electoral competition in the political system. This final slide shows us that democracy in the region has been volatile, however, as I suggested, and uh, this too is Freedom House data, and it shows that the number of free countries has largely plateaued since the early 1990s after rising significantly in 1990, uh, but the number of partly free countries uh, has uh, in increased a, a little bit and remained largely consistent, and the number of not free countries uh, unfortunately went down significantly in 1990, but has not continued to decline. So there's volatility, there's movement, there are reversals. But I think that what this is showing us, uh, just as a sort of set of snapshots, is that there were there was a decisive shift uh, in political character and political reform across the continent in the early 1990s that has not collapsed, it has not reversed. And um, what we're seeing is a complicated landscape of countries that are managing and navigating the challenges of democratic development. And so my conclusion, my takeaway is not an overtly or overly pessimistic one, but I think a realistic uh, view that democracy is here to stay. There are still a lot of core democratic values, democratic commitments and democratic regimes across the African continent. And that this is a resilient idea in the region, but one obviously that is encountering or uh, having an encounter with our current moment uh, of democratic challenges. So let me conclude there take the slideshow down, if we can, and go uh, directly to the camera and turn things over to Professor Cheeseman. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thanks to Peter and John Hopkins for the kind invitation to be here. I've loved being in Bologna, so I'm treating this as a kind of job talk. Um, there's a pitch to try and bring me back, uh, which means two things. You know, I'm going to give it my best shot. And I'm going to agree with Peter. Um, <laughs> so, so, so almost seamlessly, although we haven't actually planned this, I'm going to pick up exactly where, where Peter left off. And I'm going to talk about this democratic resilience that Peter started to talk about. And I'm going to frame it a slightly different way. I'm going to be even more provocative. I'm going to say in some ways, given the international trends we've seen, given the fact that we've seen a US government, a UK government, a European Union that has stalled on democracy promotion, given that we've seen significant economic challenges, including recessions and economic downturn across the continent due to COVID, and given the weakness of democratic institutions historically, the question we could have asked is, why is Africa not more authoritarian, right? Why is the picture that Peter just shown us not actually worse? Why have we actually seen the stickiness of systems? And if we were to actually go back to that slide, we would actually see that whilst the free countries have plateaued, we've actually seen a slight reduction in the completely unfree countries, which is not what you would expect, right? And to some extent bucks the trend that we've seen in other parts of the world. So I'm gonna try and flip the question a little bit and ask that question about why is there this resilience? Why have we not seen a complete collapse into one party states and military rule? Certainly if you went back to the early 1990s and you read some of the most critical or concerned commentary about African states, that's what you would see, a belief that we would soon see a resurrection of d d dictatorships. But we haven't. 
And not only have we seen this recycling and cycling that Peter talked about, but we've also seen a number of recent breakthroughs. Think about Nigeria 2015, the first transfer of power from the ballot box in that country, Gambia 2016, Malawi and Zambia in just the last two years when authoritarian parties were turfed out of power by resurgent oppositions. All of these examples remind us that the average figures that we're shown in, for example, Freedom House graphs contain both countries that are moving down, but also countries that are strengthening their democratic institutions. So we then need to ask a question that goes, I think, from Peter's presentation, but moves to the next step. What is that democratic resilience rooted in? Why have we not seen even more coups? Why have we not seen even more backsliding? So I'm going to suggest four key components of democratic resilience and see if I can persuade you that these four key components help to explain why we haven't seen more backsliding in the African context. The first is popular, popular opinion, popular beliefs. The second is going to be institutional. The third will be strategic and will refer to the politics of elites. And the final one will be supranational and look at regional and international institutions. Now, I thought I was going to go after um, our good friend and colleague, Jima, who would have given you a brilliant presentation on the Afrobarometer, and you'd all be nodding away, and then I could say, oh, what Jima said. Uh, but unfortunately, we're going in a different order. But the two things that I would have pointed to about his excellent presentation that you will get in a moment is, one, he will show you that actually support for democracy in Africa has proved to be reasonably robust. Although satisfaction with democracy, i.e. people's happiness with the democracy they have, has gone down significantly in the last 10 years, demand for democracy, i.e. people's belief that democracy is the best system for their country, has remained relatively stable. It's declined a little, but it hasn't fallen off a cliff. And I think the reason for this is that when people say they're dissatisfied with democracy, they're not necessarily telling us they're dissatisfied with the concept of democracy. They're telling us they're dissatisfied with the kind of democracy they have in their country. In other words, that's not necessarily giving up on the principle of democracy. It could be frustration with the democracy that's being delivered by their government. And you can see this if you look at a range of different questions. So the question that I think is most interesting in a way, given what Peter was just showing us about the coups and the issue of coups and the fact we've had so many coups in the last couple of years that has generated a lot of concern about greater militarization of politics, is that the vast majority of Africans who answer surveys, so the Afrobarometer surveys, 37 different countries, nationally representative surveys, the vast majority of people who answer those surveys tell us that they don't want military rule. They don't want one party rule. They don't want one man rule. Very high percentages in each case in the vast majority of countries. There's a couple of exceptions and we could talk about those exceptions, but on the whole, that's true. So it's not only the case that people believe that democracy is the best system. There's a strong rejection of the authoritarian alternative, even in some of those countries that had coups. So even in countries where coups were greeted on the streets with popular celebration, suggesting that people are genuinely given up on democracy. Actually, when you ask people and you get a national average, you see not 69, 70% of people reject military rule. So what were those coups celebrated for? They were celebrated for removing leaders who were themselves seen to have undermined their own democratic credentials by doing things like manipulating elections, trying to remove presidential term limits and so on. So the support for those coups is partly a support for someone coming in and sorting the game out, but it's also support for taking out leaders who themselves had undermined their own democratic credentials. So we see on the popular side, an attachment to essentially what I think most of us would recognize as a kind of human right, which is the right to be able to have a say in the decisions that affect your lives. And I think one of the challenges that each of the hunters that has taken power in West Africa will face over the next two years is that if they try and prolong their stay in power, they will become as unpopular as the leaders that they replaced. And if they try and do that in the absence of a more inclusive and more stable and more democratic politics, they will then be the ones who will be removed and there will be a popular celebration at their own removal. In other words, leaders cannot simply ignore popular opinion, even in countries of more authoritarian regimes, and that creates a degree of democratic resilience. What about the institutional resilience? But one of the things that's really interesting is that we see coups and the risk of military incursion in a number of countries, not just in the countries that we've talked about. There are a further set of countries that we might want to talk about in a moment that we might be concerned about. 
These are pretty much the countries that you would think of if you know about African politics, countries of a history of military intervention, countries in which the military has tasted power and it's been very hard to persuade them to go back to barracks. But we also have a set of countries in which the military has never intervened in politics and has actually started to be seen as an important safeguard of constitutional rule. Think about Malawi, where the president changed the head of the military in the run up to a critical election. And even though the head of the military was changed, the military refused to go out and discipline protesters. And in fact, sided with protesters and walked with them to protect them against the police who it was assumed were going to attack them. Think of Zambia, where we have good evidence to believe that in two or three elections, the military and security forces have advised the president not to deploy them around elections because they don't want to be seen to be standing against the will of the popular majority. So on the one hand, we see a sort of situation where we have a bifurcation. We have a set of countries in sub-Saharan Africa where institutions have been chronically weakened. And here I'm thinking mainly about those countries that have removed presidential term limits, countries like Uganda and so on, where we see presidents for life basically being enshrined in law. But we have a second set of cases where presidential term limits are institutionalized and where we see the military actually standing aside from politics and refusing to become involved. And that, again, creates a kind of form of institutional resilience. The third form that I said I would talk about is strategic. And this relates to the politics of elites. I think one of the things we see in a number of countries, even in countries where democracy has really struggled, and here I'm thinking about places like, say, Nigeria or Kenya, where democratic processes and transfers of power have been followed by crises and violent elections and allegations of rigging and ethnic favoritism and winner takes all politics. One of the things that characterizes both of those cases and many others like them is that there is a desperate desire within the political elite for competition. And there is an understanding within the elite, I think, in many of those cases, that even if they don't like multi-party politics, it's ultimately the only feasible system, because there is no way of agreeing how to share power in some imagined one-party state. There is no idea of having to agreeing how to share power under an all-powerful president. The idea of actually giving up on being able to win power in the future under some form of new coalition, under some form of new election, is what actually holds that political elite together. The idea of actually removing that and fixing the president for a long period of time would cause so much trouble within the political elite itself that it becomes unfeasible. And here, for example, I'm thinking about the fact that presidents in Kenya, in Nigeria in particular, in Zambia in particular, failed to be able to remove presidential term limits and secure third and fourth and fifth presidential terms, precisely because members of their own party joined forces with members of the opposition to block those legislations from going through in parliament. And the reason they did so was because those individuals wanted to have the opportunity in the future of pushing their own presidential ambitions. So the competition within the political elite itself generates an imperative to allow multi-party politics, which allows a degree of elite rotation and therefore keeps the elite more cohesive and prevents defections from the system and conflict. And the final point that I would like to raise is kind of the supranational. The three things I've talked about so far have been more domestic, but of course there is an international dimension. We saw in the case of the coups, the African Union and ECOWAS flying in and trying to negotiate and raising the stakes both through their condemnation and also in some cases through economic uh, punishments and sanctions. At the same time, we also have on the other side, an international community and in particular Western states who are at least allegedly more interested in supporting democratic states and providing funding and support for them and may if they decide that a coup is actually worth the name coup, and we can talk about the politics of coup naming later, actually cease to provide funding and therefore provide a strong financial incentive as well as a kind of legitimacy incentive to actually move away from all out authoritarianism. So we have four factors here, the popular factor, the institutional factor, the strategic factor, and the supranational factor. The problem, of course, is that we have a range of states, and Peter showed them to us earlier, some of whom I would say these three or four factors are coalescing. So I'm relatively confident about countries like Zambia, Malawi, even to an extent Kenya, Ghana, Senegal, etc. in the very long term. 
because even though they experience significant democratic challenges and often see increases and then decreases in the level of democracy in these ratings agencies, they actually have some of the fundamentals that I'm talking about there. We start to see institutions working. Kenya and Malawi have courts that actually nullified presidential elections, which is the biggest test you can imagine of the independence of the judiciary. So we actually in those institutions and in those countries start to see two or three of these building blocks coming together. And I would imagine that even in these countries, if we see democratic rollback, there will be resilience that over time will return countries to multi party politics. It's hard for me to imagine them being stable in an authoritarian context. But we also have a bunch of states in which very few of these factors are actually present. States in which natural resources mean that governments are less reliant on popular opinion and international support. So countries of large amounts of oil, for example, um, but also countries in which institutions are significantly less independent because of the historical evolution of those institutions. So many of the countries that I was identifying as having these more independent security institutions are former one party states. As the one party state, they had a civilian form of government that often evolved out of the ruling party that evolved out of the nationalist movement that won independence in the 60s. Not in all cases, but in quite a few. But in many other states, think about Rwanda, Uganda, etc. The people who are actually in power are not former civilian leaders, they're former rebel leaders. So what you actually have is a grafted rebel movement into the power structure of the state. If you don't have a civilian party, you have a military or a rebel apparatus. And in those contexts, the independence of the military and the security forces isn't there. So where you get, on the one hand, a sort of pseudo military operation masquerading as a democratic state combined with the natural resources and some of the other factors I've talked about, you then start to see that this resilience is significantly weak. So my prediction, and if we want a prediction, um, sort of where we might end up, and if we were here in 10 years time, what we might be talking about, is that we'll see a significant bifurcation. We will see a set of countries in which the factors for resilience are much stronger, that will either be as democratic as they are now, or may have developed even stronger democratic norms and values. One of the papers I most like over the last 10 years is a paper by Dan Posner and Dan Young that basically shows that in countries where term limits were broken the first time a president came up to them, almost every other president has broken term limits. In the countries where term limits were respected the first time a president came up to them, almost every subsequent president has respected term limits. In other words, there are gonna be precedent setting moments, there is gonna be institutionalization in one set of countries, and the opposite is gonna happen in the other set of countries. So my prediction would be that the graphs that we were showing will show a kind of movement over time. Those democratic states will get more democratic and solidify, but those authoritarian states might get more authoritarian and lose some of the democratic elements they still have. The critical point then, just to end on, so I don't talk for too long, is that of course there is no Africa story. Africa has three or four different stories and three or four different trajectories. And actually the differences between those countries is probably gonna be greater in 10 years time than it is now. That has really important implications. One for analysis, we need to pay attention to those very different trajectories of those very different states. But it also has really important implications for regional politics. The African Union, for example, will feature countries that are just as divided on topics like democracy and the promotion of democracy in 10 years time as it is today, which will hamper regional solutions to regional problems. But as Peter said, in many ways, this is a much more optimistic take than the headlines would suggest. And I think the importance of democratic resilience is that it shows us something important about popular opinion and the extent to which actually the idea of democracy, even though it's deeply problematic, remains a touchstone, even in quite authoritarian contexts. Thank you very much. microphone. Next, we're going to invite Professor Nwankwar uh, to join us. Here she is. Okay, great. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for um, inviting me. And um, great to see you, Nick. Um, great to see you, um, Professor Kapo. Um, and so I want to, I want to um, follow uh, Nick's um, conclusion. 
right? Uh, and to say that I, I don't imagine that we would see um, stability in authoritarian regimes um, across the continent in the near future. Um, I would, I, I think that um, Nick's uh, idea of a bifurcation uh, is more likely what we'll see, right? Uh, presently, there's no coherent um, narrative or framework around politics across the continents. And I think that's going to continue um, in the near future. Uh, but what I want to um, perhaps do is to um, echo a slightly nuanced um, version of this argument, right? Um, in, in saying that the, the recent democratic weakening and military coups at the moment uh, is just really a moment in a long, sorry saga of democratic regression across the continent. Um, I am African, right? And so I think I get the privilege to criticize the continent and the countries as much as I want to, um, right? And so uh, what, what I think is happening is only a continuation. And we can trace this continuation, um, you know, back to recent history. Uh, but what I want to say is that if, if we're talking, looking at these coups, uh, the coup in Guinea, for example, right? Uh, the Guinean coup uh, was not engineered by the military, so to speak, by, by Kondo. Um, and I do um, sympathize with the literally um, variant, you know, that sees these, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, regime extension through constitutional change as progress. Right. Um, however, I think we have to take it within the context of, um, you know, the norms of democracy and writ large. I regard that as a part of democratic progression. And so the, the, it was not the army that overthrew the constitution in Guinea. It was Conde. Right. And so the takeover, um, I would argue, is a, a direct um, a response to that constitutional overthrow. Um, you know, by, by Conde, right? To the extent, of course, you know, the massive protests and then eventually the, the, the takeover. Um, the same thing also, I would argue, uh, is what we see in Mali. The, the, the military did not overthrow the, overthrow the constitution in Mali. Uh, it was the president in collusion with the ruling party, right? Um, who overthrew the constitution by stealing uh, the opposition seats right, um, uh, in parliamentary elections, and then proceeding to use constitutional, uh, the constitution to validate that theft, right, and of course then the ensuing circumstances led to the coup. Uh, well, Burkina Faso is, is a different, you know, substantively different, right, uh, that the elected government was denied legitimacy uh, by, you know, violence. So I would argue that this current, this, this um, ongoing coup um, is, I don't think it's diffusion, right? I think it's just, you know, um, incidents. I think they are standalone incidents that, are, that could be regarded as either the culmination, right, of democratic regression, right, or um, evidencing of that democratic regression um, that has continued, um, I would argue, in fact, since independence in Africa. So um, the point then is that at the heart of the whole democracy consolidation regression debate, right, is the concept of popular representation, um, which is not just the, you know, abstract numbers um, of who is seated in the room, um, but about the, the real substance, you know, how representation serves as a mechanism um, to engineer a process of development and uplift people's lives, right? Um, uh, on the other hand, we, we could also look at it as, you know, both um, instrumentally and institutionally um, uh, it, it, to the extent that it allows self-governing people, self-governance, right? Um, uh, and individual freedom. So we, we don't talk about uh, democracy for the sake of it, right? Or we don't engage in these debates, uh, ideological debates, just you know, for the fun of it. But we engage uh, in democracy because of its capacity to engineer development, to uplift people's lives day by day. 
right, to enable self-governance and, and freedom. So the whole question of the role of representation, right, then becomes an examination of its um, substantive effect vis-a-vis -vis the diversity structures that it enables, right, uh, that gives meaning to uh, the democratic system and drives substantive democracy uh, in effect, right? So we can then say uh, that effective and equitable representation kind of foolproofs um, against democratic decay. So this means uh, that uh, people live in the context of their identities. So we have to talk about groups, right? Identity groups. So it's not just 50 people, um, it's 50 men, right? It's 50 women and so on. So this is where the discussion of the role of women, right? Makes democracy as we know and practice it rather scandalous, right? I mean, we continue to talk in percentages, um, in proportions uh, and share of women vis-a-vis -vis the predominance of men in democratic institutions. Uh, in itself is evidence of democratic regression, right? Um, and, 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 and so the institutions um, that contribute to the refining of, uh, of the democratic project needs full um, equal representation. You know, the parliament, the judiciary, um, the cabinet, the media, right? Women's equal representation is crucial. The question we um, need to continually answer therefore is, how are women represented in these institutions, right? Because, um, I mean, it, it, we live continually, uh, continuously um, try to avoid the elephant in the room, right? How are women represented in these institutions? Uh, one might say, of course, that Africa is not unique in this sense. Um, after all, before the First World War, um, women had the votes only in four countries, um, Norway, Finland, um, Australia, and uh, New, New Zealand, I think. Uh, and, and I mean, Switzerland only uh, gave women uh, uh, the votes in 1994. Uh, but most of these countries of the North are consolidated democracies, so to speak, right? Uh, and and um, not engaging in these uh, discussions of democratic regression or, 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 or not. Um, although, of course, um, recent events in the United States might throw a wrench in that argument. So, so while in Africa, while, while um, Africa is not unique in that sense, it is also the fact uh, that the whole um, history of um, colonialism, right, um, has complicated Africa's fortune and the possibility uh, for democracy. And we know that whenever and wherever history um, uh, 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 complicates the, the ongoing project of democracy, women get the short end of the stick. Second thing I want to point out here, you know, in making, uh, you know, uh, as evidence of my arguments that what we should really be talking about really uh, is democratic regression and that it is ongoing in Africa, right? And now while we, um, I agree with Nick, while we look to the future to see bifurcated, um, you know, a bifurcation between countries that are more authoritarian and those that are more democratic, I would argue that we, would, we should still look at those countries, you know, um, on the continuum, right, uh, spectrum of uh, regression, democratic regression. Um, so the second point I want to make there is that in the popular imagination of, of peoples across the continent, right, there's a tendency to equate um, power to masculinity. So national aspirations across most of the continent is encapsulated in the word virile. Right, um, you know, in Nigeria, of course, uh, we are looking to build a virile economy, right? Build a virile nation, and so on. Virility is an entirely masculine attribute, right? As fertility is constructed as a feminine attribute, so the notion of virility entered the national discourse uh, in the in the in the um, military era. But in in the case of Nigeria during the Gowon regime. Uh, during the Gowon regime. And, and since then became, has become a totalitarian concept, right, in the articulation of national aspiration. And the sad thing though, is that it has become so normalized, right? That we don't see how it performs this continuing marginalization of the feminine, of women and other feminized um, groups.
So that masculinization of power, right? Um, of course, you know, uh, because we, in the military, of course, we know that there are no, rarely do we find um, women in combat command, right? Uh, certainly across Africa, West Africa, there are none. You know, we might find some in, in Southern Africa, um, but across the continent, you can count those, you know, uh, on, on, on the fingers. Uh, in, in the popular imagination is what makes the military a continuing option and structure in governance and power on the continent, um, especially the reversion to the ideas of manhood and masculinity uh, as the only viable organizational option in, in the face of hardship, right? Is this imagination of politics and power as masculine, right? So why would that be the only option, right? Why is, why, why is that the go-to structure, right? Um, in, in the absence, uh, you know, in, in the face of, of challenges to, to, um, to a, a country. So while we may have had democratic legitimacy, you know, I mean, so to speak, vis-a-vis -vis elections, right? However flawed uh, those are, uh, we're yet to address the underlying masculinization of power, right? because we essentially switched from fatigues to starched cotton and, and all of that. I mean, we know, of course, that we have this history, as I was saying, uh, from, you know, post-Berlin, right? I mean, the, the African state project um, is a martial project, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a military, militarized project. And I, I, I am not convinced that that has changed. And so um, when we're looking at these schools, we need to look at them in, as a continuum. Right, rather than you know these events that just uh, came up, and I think that was part of you know the the the, the gaps in the literature of the coup, um, you know uh, that that established uh, you know democracy in Africa, is the tendency to look at them as a response, right, rather than as a continuation of the 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 state, the African pro state project, right, from from martial laws, from the colonial martial laws. Um, so. Uh, as, as I signaled earlier, um, if we're speaking about democratic regression, uh, when, when did we have democratic maturity? Did we ever have democratic maturity, right? Um, so I would, I would suggest that we go back to that history and perhaps trace those currents and then perhaps it will give us the, uh, the, the register, right? Uh, the terminologies or the frameworks within which to um, uh, within which to understand uh, current events in Africa. Um, I maybe will stop here and then uh, take questions uh, in particularly uh, as they regard uh, women's uh, representation and uh, what that means for either democratic regression um, or democratic consolidation. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we'll now turn to uh, Professor Okafor. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lewis. Uh, great uh, to be here among uh, all the distinguished minds, some of my footnotes uh, over the years. <laughs> I have to apologize at the beginning that I probably have to run to teach my Washington class uh, right after. I'm not trying to dodge your questions, but... <laughs> I would, I would, I, I probably would not be able to stay uh, for that, regrettably. Um, so, I, so I agree with uh, virtually everything that is said, which is rare if you know know me. Uh, so it's all excellent. I kept going. Oh damn! I wanted to say that. <laughs> Why did you say that? You know. Um, but you know, I, I will have a few. Um, shall we say, tributaries here and there. So, so I agree, two opposing currents, and I wrote it here before <laughs> Nick said it, okay? Uh, but, and there's more stability, more stasis than change, clearly. I think that's on a pan uh, sort of continental basis. I think that's fairly clear if you look at it in detail. Um, and that's, again, <laughs> it's here before Professor Wankwa uh, said it, uh, to the extent that states were even democratic to begin with. So as a question of the quality of the plateau, right? That's an important point. And that is uh, in many cases like Ghana, as we speak, which is one of the better examples, even to a Nigerian. Um, 
<laughs> if you know, you know, um, uh, of, of democracy on the continent, recent events, ironically, by a human rights, former human rights activist president, I began to put that under question, including the election itself, the last one, and more recent events. So the quality of the plateau itself, right, uh, on, it, it's, it's, it's an important point that we, we need to address. So taking the example of West Africa, I don't mean to be West Africa or even Nigeria centric here. Um, and this sort of, I didn't look at the, um, the, the slides that Peter had, but I just West Africa, I looked at, I counted seven to 11, I call largely democratic, uh, three to five largely non-democratic because it's complicated, right? Um, um, so for me, it went beyond non-military coup to, you know, the extent of free elections, uh, uh, you know, peaceful transfers of power, that sort of thing, respect for human rights and the rule of law. Um, so if we use additional indicators other than the absence of military uh, forcible takeover of power, um, there is a slight re regression, uh, a slight, it's very slight overall on the continental-wide basis, uh, inter, you know, given the unconstitutional changes of government in the last uh, couple of years or so, uh, harsh election-related repression in some countries, uh, shakiness, I would call it, in human rights and electoral legitimacy in more established uh, democracies, uh, and a kind of persistence of a quasi or semi-democratic quality in key countries, and it's not because I'm Nigerian, but it is a key country, one out of every five Africans is Nigerian. So if it's democratic, you know, a fifth of Africa will be living under a democracy. So it is a, it is a key country, but it is a quasi-democracy, and I've said that in earlier work, uh, in, a, in a way that is extremely complicated to describe, right? Where you can feel it and touch it if you're there. It is democratic uh, in important ways, but in other ways, uh, and there seemed, uh, I don't mean to single out any regime, but there seem to be certain questions in the last few years, uh, but also certain improvements using technology. So that it's very complex. Um, the, the question then, the, the, or the puzzle, um, is whether we're seeing the beginning of a more significant trend, right? I'm not as alarmed as, as the headlines right now, this moment, because I see more Stasis, as one of has said, over the long durée. Uh, but is it the beginning of something worse, right? I don't know, right? Um, <laughs> but so, but so Louis talks about levels of analysis. And actually, that's my second point. I don't know how uh, <laughs> we keep sort of uh, thinking together. Or if you like, maybe I should change it to layers of analysis. In terms of the pr uh, uh, pressure, uh, for the rule of law, uh, human rights, and democratization, which as a lawyer I tend to see as uh, working together. So three levels, pressure from below, what I call lateral pressure, and pressure from above, uh, sort of the last one tying with what Nick was uh, uh, saying. So pressure from below, you know, civil society and so on. Uh, so labor, which was huge in Nigeria, has declined. That's something that is not generally mapped. Labor is extremely weakened now, in part through uh, clandestine government demobilization. The student movement, which I was in, is, you know, my, one of my colleagues jokes about the difference between the Lion King generation and the Black Panthers. These are Lion King, you know, this is Disney World student movement, right? Uh, so one probably knows. Uh, yeah, it is still moving in Nigeria and labor basically got democracy. You see, even all the human rights activists, they were student leaders, pretty much. In Nigeria, these were tough, ideologically clear, courageous, almost to a fault, student leaders. What we have now are almost gongos as student <laughs> movements, and it's one of my greatest regrets as a participant in that movement. So, so for me, an important structural sort of buffers for democracy are weakened. Now that doesn't translate necessarily to say it's going to go, you know, become terrible, but 
I, I look at those indicators and have concerns. I'm not saying, you know, it's not doomsday yet or anything like that, but I have concerns. Um, so that's one. Um, lateral pressure from within. So I talk about the legislature, the judiciary. And, and why, why, is, why is this important to me? It's important to me because the way I look at it, um, <laughs> excuse me, part of, an important part of the crisis of democratic legitimacy on the continent is a, what I call a crisis of state capture, not by some corporatist elements, but by the executive branch, whoever seizes control of the executive branch then moves against the democracy. So we've seen that in the last eight years, for example, in Nigeria, a weakened legislature it used to be, <laughs> as Professor Cheeseman said, that actually the ruling party elements are the ones who kept, even with a two-third majority, kept the president, the executive in check. We don't have that as we speak right now in Nigeria. We have Nigerians joke and call them, what they call them, yes members. <laughs> you know, whatever the president sends. And anytime they go against the president, everybody's like, wow, oh, really, right? That was never the case which is a very interesting element in Nigerian politics. It's not so much the opposition. It's actually the ruling party legislators that used to hold the executive to account. So these are concerns um, that I, I have. The judiciary has been weakened. Uh, a sitting, not even the military in Nigeria removed a sitting chief justice. In the last eight years, it happened. A sitting illegally. And it's done, listen to me, read the cases, the Court of Appeal, ruled that it was illegal, right? Illegally removed through all kinds of legal contraptions that you go to sleep if I, if I by clever lawyers, you know, you know what they say about lawyers, um, used to remove a sitting chief justice, it, unconstitutionally, clearly unconstitutionally. Um, uh, so anyway, these are some, some, some um, if Nigeria-centric uh, uh, reasons for some concern that what may look democratic on the surface, may not in many ways be as solid as it is if someone is actively, you know, sort of attacking the basic building blocks that has worked in the recent past, right? Um, and then of course, Professor Chisman talked about pressure from above. So, uh, 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 so ECOWAS of course has a relatively robust, at least on paper, legal and institutional framework for trying to protect uh, shall we say, I wouldn't go as far as saying existing democracies, but existing uh, rule, <laughs> constitutional rule. They're not necessarily the same thing, right? Um, uh, so there's a protocol of democracy and good governance of 2001, and there's a supplementary act, a kind of treaty on sanctions. And of course, they have envoys that he talked about decisions of the assembly. Uh, uh, you've been told already about Mali and all that very almost um, cruel and unusual uh, type of punishment sanctions. You know, all borders uh, are supposed to be closed. All assets are supposed to be. It's not been since the ninth, uh, uh, early 2000s that those kinds of overbroad sanctions were levied at the UN level, right? Because of the recognition that they can cause indiscriminate harm to the civil but they just levied that in Mali. Whether it's working is another, another question, right? So they are using that and that's, that's a form of pressure, right? Both symbolic uh, and, and non-symbolic. Um, and they have a relatively long-standing uh, history of doing so, including uh, through military action, right? Which they threatened, they almost did in Gambia actually. Uh, I hear the Senegalese troops had actually moved in. It's not very hard for Senegalese troops to move into the Gambia, right? Um, they're, they're right next door. Now, is it successful, this regime that ECOWAS has? I don't know. Uh, I can only think of the Gambia. But actually thinking, point out the Gambia troubles me. If it's just the Gambia that you can successfully pressure and it's filled in Burkina, it's, you know what I mean? <laughs> That's... Not the smallest, but about the smallest, least powerful country. So what does it tell us about the capacity to move against a Ghana or Nigeria should the case arise? That may be, um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to be pessimistic, but that may be uh, difficult, right? Um, 
that, that you can move. So, and thirdly, there's a, there's a there's sort of crisis of legitimacy. I, I, I tend to read what I call the street sort of commentary <laughs> on, on Nigerian blogs, right? The average person just dismisses ECOWAS sanctions uh, on the basis of the credentials of a lot of people, you know, people like Nasimbe in Togo, you know, sitting around and sanctioning Mali. I mean, a lot of people just saw that as the, the hypocrisy was glaring, right? Uh, uh, so there is a little bit of a crisis of legitimacy in terms of certain of the, not all of them clearly, not even most of them, but too many of the people who themselves ought to be sanctioned that are uh, they're sanctioning this and that of their country somehow because they managed to maintain themselves in power, not because they're democratic. Um, anyway, um, the African Union is a similar story, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bore you with that. So um, in the end, though, uh, 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 I think as Nick and as Peter pointed out, the local matters a lot, I think. Right? The local story, uh, um, all politics, I think it was a US speaker, Tiffany says, all politics is local. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, great, thank you. I think we've been joined by Professor Jima Boade. Uh, oh, here he is. Oh, oh yo, Mike. Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, Mike. Mike. Yeah. We've been joined by Professor Jima Boade, so I think we can uh, turn the, uh, the panel over to you. Jima, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Uh, my apologies to all of you. Um, I was caught up in the um, board meeting, um, which and really didn't work with uh, the time for, for this meeting. So I'm so sorry I'm the, I'm the loser because I, 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 I would have loved to uh, hear uh, from colleagues. I'm lucky to have caught the remarks of the, of, the, of the last speaker. But just for, it will help me if you give me, uh, Peter, if you give me a sense of what you would want me to address specifically because, you know, I have some ideas, but maybe I can be more efficient. If you yeah, it's it's you know you're jumping into the middle, and and I am, we understand. Um, so I provided some. Uh, I started off with some top line numbers, basically mostly Freedom House, Polity uh, types of numbers. Looking at uh, starting off with the the recent headlines about coups and coup attempts in Africa, the uh, global setting of authoritarian developments and uh, headwinds uh, against uh, or headwinds uh, of democratic development or headwinds against democratic development. Uh, some of the pessimism, both globally and in Africa, about prospects for democracy, um, but then pivoted to look at where the actual trends uh, seem to be. Uh, and we see both a diverse political landscape uh, in different regions, notably West Africa, Southern and East Africa. We see a declining trend uh, ar around coups and military interventions, notwithstanding the recent flurry of incidents that we've seen, but compared to the 60s, the 70s and the 80s, many fewer military adventures than previously. Uh, and we have seen a dramatic shift, a tectonic shift, I call it, in the nature of governance on the African continent with the proliferation of both electoral and liberal democracies across many parts of the region after 1990, and a trend that has not collapsed or appreciably declined. Uh, again, keeping in mind legitimate observations about democratic recession. Uh, we then turn to uh, Nick Cheeseman, who made, I think, a robust case and a robust defense of the prospects for continued democratic development and, if we can call it that, consolidation in certain countries and certain parts of the continent, but also signaled uh, that there are some subregions and some countries which are going to be impervious to these trends. Not, however, uh, elite interests, institutional guardrails, uh, popular perceptions, and international norms are supporting democracy 
uh, around the region. Uh, Professor Nwankwar pointed to uh, problems of democratic development surrounding uh, the quality of democracy, the delivery of public goods or the delivery of democratic dividends in terms of livelihoods, in terms of equity, in terms of popular aspirations. And she particularly flagged gender imbalances and gender inequities as a, uh, a critical issue and a critical gap in the, uh, in the promise of democratic inclusion, uh, which signals, uh, in, in fact, imbalances in uh, popular inclusion and can undermine the legitimacy and the quality of uh, democratic regimes. And then uh, I think you heard a lot of what uh, yeah, Professor Okafor had to say. So over to you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks for indulging me because it also uh, gives me uh, a bit of um, a meaningful entry point, uh, a point of entry into the discussion. But <clears throat> I believe you've been talking about democracy setbacks uh, in Africa. I think um, it's important, at least from the vantage of the Afrobarometer, to keep in mind that in most cases, for the most part, the problem is largely a supply problem. It's uh, the failure of governments, the failure of political elites uh, to supply democratic as well as democracy related goods, uh, which from several, many, many iterations of parameter surveys, we can say with a fair degree of certainty that for the most part, there is strong popular support for democracy and accountable governance across the continent. Um, just there are country variations as always, and I'll come to that um, shortly. But I also think uh, it's important when we're looking at the, these challenges and uh, setbacks to democracy in Africa, it's also important to recognize that there are also demand gaps and that a key demand gap in consistently um, revealed in Afrobarometer findings is that you know, the people, uh, after a lot of our survey respondents uh, tend to be, tend not to be alive to their responsibilities and as citizens and, and, uh, and even their rights. So for instance, when you, you ask the question about um, whether, you know, whose, whose job is it to ensure that the president does his or her job once elected, I just, um, you get a majority saying is the, is the citizen, but it's a very large minority that, that, tell, that, will say, that still believe that it's the job of the president or the parliamentarian to police uh, himself or herself and uh, ensure that he or she does a good job. That I take it to be a major, a, a major, a major gap. Uh, so just for us to keep in mind that while the, the problem tends to be more on the supply side, there are also important demand gaps. And, and, and that when we say you cannot have a democracy, you cannot build a democracy without Democrats, there are some sense in, in which um, the African citizens tend to come short when it comes to democratic citizenship. That's the second point I want to make, I want to make is that again, from the advantage of the, of the Afrobarometer surveys and the Afrobarometer data, over time trends within countries tell you can, a lot more to know about the democratic futures of these countries than maybe when you look at uh, the, when, when, than when you look at the broad picture. So for instance, we find in the, in the latest survey for which we have full, um, a full data set, South Africa, for instance, now you have a, 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 you know, the, a minority, it's, it's albeit a large minority um, that say that they support democracy, 
that they, they prefer democracy to any other form of government. That is very serious. And when you look at the Ubatan trend in that country, this is the first time we are registering this level of, this very low level of popular support for democracy over non-democratic alternatives of government. Um, and you, I'm sure you know, you've, 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 come, you've been referencing developments in, uh, in Burkina Faso and other places in West Africa. Again, uh, support for military rule uh, or rejection of military rule is lowest in Burkina Faso. That has not always been the case. Uh, the rejection of military rule is very strong, very high across Africa, Burkina Faso included. But in the recent survey, there's been a, it's a, a rejection is only a minority opinion in that country. And that again will now explain partly why there were street humiliations welcoming the military, the, the soldiers who staged the coup and welcoming the military government and also condemning ECOWAS, France, and other external um, international community actors who say um, the, the soldiers were not welcome. So just, um, and then other, other, indi other indicators that seem to give clues about some of the challenges that the we are having with democracy in West Africa, I mean, in Africa today. One of them, key one, is declining levels of trust in a key state institutions, key democratic institutions, especially declining levels of trust in presidents. In, and, it, and this was particularly true in an interest, a striking in the case of Mali, where for in the last Afghanistan survey in Mali, you find that you know, the, the military enjoyed very high levels of trust and the president at the time, the deposed one, did, did not earn even half of the trust that the military or the Malian military was enjoying. So that, that also, and then of course the uh, rising perception of corruption. Um, corruption has always been an important one. Well, corruption continues to register uh, concern of corruption, perception of corruption continues to register high percentages and especially corruption in the presidency. So just to, and then the third point I want to make is that context always matters. Context, local context, national context always matters. And that some, at least so far as West Africa is concerned, some of the, the setbacks with democracy that we are experiencing also has a lot to do with the, with episodic factors and ailments uh, such as the jihadist incursions that have been uh, making steady progress south, you know, from, uh, the, the, from, from, from the Sahara uh, uh, to all the way towards uh, uh, the coastal path, coastal regions of West, of West Africa. And that this really is partly, um, a spin-off is partly um, stems with an effect from the, from the uh, overthrow of the Gaddafi regime and the Tuareg rebels that he had trained and had been using as mercenaries, um, moving back into Niger and to Mali and, um, and spreading out, so, and creating chaos. Some of these challenges have to do with climate change. I'm not, you know, they are not um, necessarily the problems, you know, it's not that governments of West of Africa or West Africa or the Sahel have been particularly inept. Um, they are faced with challenges that would, that, will, that will be difficult, that will be hard to deal with for any government, for any, any, any country. So I think uh, sometimes we need to keep context in mind so that 
we do not um, get too despondent about what is happening on the continent and um, also somehow associated with democracy, even though those developments do have, often do have negative implications for democratic development. Um, the one other point I wanted to make, and I think my last comment would focus on is, is looking at weak institutions, including democratic ones. And when I say um, Africa is afflicted, many parts of Africa is af are afflicted by weak institutions. I mean, weakness in, in, in pure bureaucratic terms. Um, there is a sense in which effectiveness of anything, ability to ca carry through with programs and to make intentions uh, become reality has to do with physical capacity, with institutional capacity, with bureaucratic capacity. And I think we have not paid enough attention to these issues. And so we have all these, uh, we have a panoply of institutions and they are all supposed to be doing great things on paper. But then when you look at the bureaucracies behind them, you, there is no reason to expect that whatever they are supposed to do for those institutions uh, will be done. And then finally, finally, uh, they, it's time to go back and look at the cons constitutional designs in many of, many of these African democracies. And that to the extent that you have constitutions that invariably um, create imperial presidencies, then uh, you are not likely to have effective institutional checks and balances, and you are not likely to be able to prevent democracy and state capture and democratic collapse. Thanks. The microphone. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jima, for those comments. One, one intervention I'll just make and then we'll open up the floor is um, there seems to be a contradiction between what Nick Cheeseman said and what Jima Bilotti said, because Nick Cheeseman says that uh, Afrobarometer numbers tell us that there are big majorities demanding democracy uh, and large numbers of people uh, rejecting proposed uh, options that are non-democratic. In other words, when Afrobarometer asks these questions, and this is the dominant survey instrument in Africa, it says, do you think that democracy is the best system for everybody in your country? Do you think that a democratic and authoritarian system might be okay in some circumstances and people can choose? And 75%, 80%, 85% of most citizens in most countries say we prefer democracy. Do you reject military rule? You get big majorities. Do you reject one party rule? You get big majorities. Do you re reject strongman rule? You get majorities. However, if you create an index of people who say all four of those things at once, you get what Professor uh, Jima Bawadi is talking about, which is that there's a softening of resolve. Um, and then the proportion of Africans who are saying we prefer democracy under all circumstances and we reject any non-democratic alternative, that's going down. Uh, perhaps not to critical levels, but obviously in some countries the levels are critical. So both of these things can be happening at the same time. It requires some teasing out. And the last thing I'll just say. Can I make, can I make a small interjection? Please, go ahead, please. <laughs> I, I, it, I may have been spoken though, because I don't think um, I meant to say that uh, support for democracy is weakening as such. What I, what I wanted to say rather was that in some countries, if you look at over time trends, you find a weakening in demand and support for democracy. And you see uh, some increase significant increase in acceptance of non-democratic forms of government. In that sense, 
I'm not sure um, what, I, what I said would be contradictory to, uh, to the summary that Nick gave. So I just wanted to fix that. Actually, I think we're being consistent here, but it's a nuance and a clarification. And the final thing that just for the general audience to be clear on is that Afrobarometer speaks in terms of demand and supply of democracy. Demand being how much do citizens want democracy? And those levels have remained consistently high, uh, with obviously some variations in some countries at some times, as Professor Jimuwani said. Um, however, this, the assessment of the supply of democracy, and this is consistent with what Nick is saying, what Chieto is saying, is, uh, is, is more problematic. And so how much do you want democracy? Well, 75, 80% of people say, I want it under all circumstances. How satisfied are you with the quality of democracy in your country? Those numbers can be considerably lower. And then you ask questions about how much you trust institutions and how solid rights are and what is your perception of how the government is doing. And then you get a very different set of assessments of the supply of democracy from the demand of democracy. So it's just useful to clarify that so that we're all, uh, I guess, on the same page in terms of understanding how this is framed. Let me stop here. And Hi, um, not a question per se, but a bit of a comment on what um, Mr. Gima said at the end about um, constitutions being important. So a little bit of context, um, the Kenyan constitution is considered like one of the most democratic constitutions in Africa, I think. Um, it covers a lot of things, um, especially, you know, ex extended judicial freedoms as well as gender representation. But the issue comes in the implementation of the constitution. The constitution has been under constant onslaught for the last few years, even by the president himself to attempt to change it and increase um, executive powers. But the, um, when it comes to the gender issue perspective, um, it guarantees a third of parliament be female female representation. But the implementation of this aspect has been really difficult uh, because of the political culture that exists to the point that they've had to create um, for, like they've had to create extra seats to ensure that they meet the requirement of at least 33% of, of, of parliament being um, female. So um, on the matter of, of, of the constitution, obviously it's very important to democratization, but where do we stand on governments actually respecting their own, their own constitutions, and how do we ensure um, that you know these these constitutions remain um, legitimate and, and respected in these spaces? Professor Nwankor, do you want to respond to that? Um, I think I would leave the constitutional scholars in uh, with us to respond to that. Um, I think uh, Nick, um, you know, um, maybe you want to take that. Yeah, well, I also I work a lot on Kenya, so I, I share your concern. Um, for those who don't know, essentially, we've seen Parliament fail to bring to life this constitutional provision. The Constitution said, and it's actually quite cleverly worded not more than one third, right? So it doesn't actually specify women. It just says there shouldn't be more than two thirds of any one gender in parliament, um, which is quite a nice way of doing it because it doesn't specify which women it more tries to prevent discrimination. But parliament has repeatedly failed to enact this. To be fair to them, and you know, we might not want to be fair because it's fairly clear what they're doing, but it is slightly tricky in that Kenya has a first past the post political system, electoral system, which makes it slightly difficult to bring in a quota. It is slightly more tricky than under a proportional representation system. But it is very clear that this is male MPs protecting their domain, right? And male MPs systematically failing to do this to the point where the, the chief justice of the country, um, the head of the Supreme Court, actually condemned parliament and hit out at parliament in quite a public way that I think is probably fairly rare for chief justices across sub-Saharan Africa, stating that parliament had clearly failed to do this and was therefore in contempt of the constitution, even that didn't do it. And I don't know if you've actually seen the Building Bridges Initiative legislation 
uh, that, that has been proposed by Raila Odinga slash Kenyatta slash others in the government, but it's not clear to me that even that legislation, although it does tweak gender and it would create uh, a female seat for every male seat in the Senate, it's not clear to me that that would deliver us the constitutional requirement at the National Assembly level. So even if the BBI process had gone through, which it hasn't, um, we would still be in a situation where there will be serious question marks about the gender quota in Kenya. So I think you're completely right. And I think, you know, the other speakers we've heard are completely right also that the gender representation is a major issue. And I think there's a broader point here, right, which is that we have ways of measuring democracy around the world that do not weight very heavily women's political representation or the treatment of gay, lesbian minorities. We just don't, right? Because if they did, there's a bunch of countries out there that have hardly any women in their parliaments and treat, you know, gay and um, homosexual communities terribly, that will be ranked much lower. So we've, we've deliberately created a set of democracy indexes that are much more about procedures than they are about fair treatment. And we always have to keep that in mind when we're looking at these figures that they, they mask an awful lot of things. The only caveat I would say to have a more positive line is you're absolutely right that the Kenya constitution has been under threat and you're right on the gender quota completely. But it's also true that we just saw the Supreme Court um, reject the proposed changes to the constitution, which would have been quite substantial. We've also seen that court defend um, you know, electoral quality by rejecting the election, the first election in 2017. And we've also seen, I think, a lot of mobilization of different groups around the constitution, using the constitution to bring legislation, using the constitution to bring cases to the judiciary, asking the judiciary to help them. And in that sense, I think it's kind of a battle, right? We now see a battle around the constitution, but the constitution to some extent is holding firm. There hasn't been a reversal of devolution. There hasn't been a reversal of the independence of the Supreme Court. So although you're completely right that loads of issues have been problematic, and in particular the police and the management of the police, I'm still hopeful that we still have that Supreme Court, we still have devolution, that some of those key elements can't be taken back. But you're right, I think we have to say this, that in every country, the constitution is a living document and it needs to be fought for and protected. And the Kenyan constitution won't be fully implemented unless those battles are won. And that's why I think just we should go to another question in a second. But I think one of the things that, that I do agree with some of the more concerned commentators about is that the thing that worries me is the hollowing out of civil society. You know, my Kenyan friends think that Kenyan civil society is its weakest since the 90s. I think the point that our colleague was making about the weakening of trade unions, the weakening of student movements, those are the organizations that are go out, go out there and fight for the constitution and protect it when it comes under attack. And the weakening and hollowing out of those groups is one of the things that if we wanted a reason to be worried about the future, that would be where I would start, yeah. Where are the checks and balances, where's the count? Just to, just to add to, add to um, the comments that Nick and others have made, just, uh, I must say that you know, despite the challenges the, the Kenyan con constitution faces, despite uh, some of the uh, things it is still being unable to accomplish, I take a lot, lot of hope in the fact that effective constitutional action uh, can help to address a lot of issues and also to prevent some of the setbacks to, the, to democracy, as Nick has said. I think I'll say the same thing about the South African constitution, which again uh, does, and, in, and in, in, that, in the case of South Africa, that constitution does better to address gender issues than, than most in Africa. So I still think good, Constitutional design is an important way to go if we are to save ourselves from some of the debacles democracy is running into in many parts of Africa. Um, so my question uh, is about how some scholars have argued that for a continent whose borders were arbitrarily drawn by its former colonizers, um, some have argued that the nation state model would never work and some have taken it as far to say that it's uh, it, it in itself is an obstacle to building viable democracies. Um, and then we see cases like Ghana and Senegal who have achieved 
um, these Western standards of, of, of democratic qualities. And that still doesn't seem to shift um, the narrative that was described by Dr. Cheeseman and, and Dr. Nguyen Kaur. And so I'm curious um, if data and graphs are essential to understanding global trends, how do these metrics um, exclude Africa and how might we rethink them um, to get a better understanding of political processes and trajectories in the region? Um, so I, I, I am not quite sure I understand the question, uh, but let me see if I can rephrase um, the question you asked. So um, are, you, are you saying that it would seem as though um, that states across Africa um, are doing poorly because of the global indices used in um, assessing democracy? And so that even uh, with Ghana and Senegal um, performing um, at levels that would be considered um, relatively strong, that even then um, they are not, is that what you're saying? More just are, are these metrics um, themselves an obstacle or do they exclude um, the, the, do they exclude the, the continent and how might we add um, elements to these rankings to be able to uh, better celebrate the victories of African democracy and get a clear picture of their shortcomings? Okay, um, so I'll just, you know, um, take a, uh, just an aspect of this and then I'll leave a uh, um, uh, and uh, Nick to uh, look at the rest. Um, it, it's been an enduring um, d d debate, right? Um, has has uh, the concept of the modern state done, um, been unjust to Africa, right? Um, has the, the parameters used in measuring um, statehood, uh, modernity, right? Have, uh, is, it, is it a fact that those um, have in significant aspects uh, created uh, this utopia um, for Africa, right, to the extent that Africa is, is, is a different uh, kettle of fish, right, a different, I don't think so, right, um, I think that uh, what we should be looking at, uh, perhaps, right, because um, except we want to argue after, um, you know, the, the, the instrumentalization of uh, politics, right? Uh, in which case we're saying, you know, that the African state is a different kind of state and so that the functions and the dysfunctions therefore can be excused or that we have to be able to create new parameters, right? With which we, we measure African states. Um, if we're not making that argument, then the argument we're then making or what we're looking at is within the context of established parameters, right? The rule of law, um, accountability, right, uh, governance, within those established parameters, how can we strengthen institutions within African states, right, to perform to um, a, a, a expected levels? That's one, two. In, to answer that question, I think perhaps what we should also realize is that we're talking about relatively, you know, new states here, right? Uh, we tend to measure African states um, against um, democracies that have been, uh, you know, two centuries and counting um, and, and all of that. And we measure African states against um, democracies that have not um, experienced the, you know, the complications, right, of, of colonialism. So I think if we place African states within the context of global statehood, of modern statehood, but with the caveat, right, that one, these are it relatively mod, um, uh, new, relatively um, infant states, right? Um, and that these, it, it, within those uh, infancy then, that there are this complicated history of, of, of colonialism, then perhaps we begin to understand um, what these are. But when we talk about celebrating the, the, well, celebrating the victories in Africa, um, I completely agree with you, right? In Africa, of course, we have, 
you know, some of the um, states that have the most um, representation of women, right? Uh, we're talking Rwanda, you know, Uganda and all of that. But then again, you know, look at this substance of, of, of regime in, within those countries, right? So I think that we should um, focus our attention on the substance of democracy, right? How do we um, refine the systems, right? And the mechanism, the systems and the processes within African states so that they would um, uh, actually deliver the dividends of, of democracy. The arguments I made about the fact that we should actually be looking at these occurrences in Africa, right? On a continuum um, in terms of democratic regression. Um, I, I, I still stand uh, by that. Right, because if we ask ourselves, okay, so if we're looking at the key elements of democracy, of how are African states performing? Um, we see that uh, there's a, 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 a form of uh, regression in political participation, right? Uh, there's a, um, a voter turnout is decreasing across the continent. Um, authoritarian instincts um, is ascendant, right? Uh, because of worsening governance. So you have people reversing to self, um, uh, uh, help, right? Uh, for example, in Nigeria, uh, the military is uh, is is subordinated. You know, the military is is um, dispatched to over thirty four states. Out of the thirty six states, you have dispatched to over thirty four states, right? Um, and then you you with regards to parliament and judiciary and, and the police and the media, and um, you have these institutions significantly eroded, right? So parliamentary ineffectiveness um, uh, to, to, to maintain um, oversight over the, the, the president, over the presidency or the executive is one of the main drivers of corruption. And for as long as we keep um, talking about corruption, we will continue to have, you know, um, developing or, or worsening um, uh, worsening variables in terms of democratic regression. And then we'll have civil society, right? Civil society is under attack in most of Africa, right? Um, the conditions of engagement is, is, is not conducive at all. In fact, um, it's, it's, uh, there's extreme risk. Um, civil society is uh, engaging under uh, massive insecurity. Um, and so, and then, and then you also have regimes of rights, right? Human rights um, is, if one looks at the State Department report that just came out, right, that is significantly eroded. Um, and then you have the state of the media, right? And that is one of the most concerning aspects of the reversion of the, the, the democratic regression across uh, the continent. So we cannot measure um, Africa uh, differently, right? We cannot set variables. Uh, that measures Africa differently. We have to um, assess Africa within the, 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 the committee of nations, right? Um, within the United Nations, what we just have to do um, is to look at the one, the internal factors uh, that drive these currents and also the external factors. And perhaps one of the ways uh, or one of the major factors is the role of external, um, you know, uh, external actors, right? Uh, this, this, this drive for for control of resources and strategic influence needs to be um, re-examined. Needs to be, um, you know, brought under control because, of course, we know that the coup uh, in 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 Mali and Burkina Faso has a significant external um, uh, role in there, right? So, um, I, I. While I agree with you that there's been a lot of victories to be celebrated in Africa, um, I also think that uh, you know there's still a lot of work uh, to be done um, in terms of um, you know statehood and democracy, and that we have to we have to um, assess or uh, uh, Africa as we assess the rest of the world, right? Uh, and, and then look at ways of strengthening the states and democracy in Africa. Okay, thank you. Um, I think at this point, we'll let that be the last word. Uh, I will simply intervene and, and perhaps on behalf of Professor Jima Boadi and say that it's been Afrobarometer's agenda and task and goal for the last uh, 20, almost 25 years to uh, provide universal data and universal metrics of 
the quality of governance and the lived experience of Africans. And so uh, we're always trying to get better data and improve the quality of measurements and understanding. But the idea that there's an exceptional uh, sort of uh, separate reality that's not captured by uh, standard measurements, I think is something that we, at least personally, I would push back on. But um, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, very much for, for participating at distance over multiple time zones, uh, our audience for uh, coming out late and uh, being so attentive and resilient in your own way at the end of the semester and the end of a full day. And uh, thanks to everybody who participated. And again, sorry, I missed that. I missed a lot of a lot of the proceedings. Great to see you all. Thanks, Jamie. We'll get you again. We'll tap you again. <laughs> You're not <laughs> off the hook. <laughs>